Hello everyone, welcome to my channel Jai Sri Jawaji. Let's continue with part 12, the four seasons of marriage. Today I readily admit that my negative thinking was a culprit. If you are living in the fall or winter season of marriage, my guess is that you too have the tendency to blame your spouse and are failing to recognize your own negative attitudes. If you want to break free from the coldness of bitter, I challenge you to devour the truth in this chapter. Changing your attitude can be a catalyst that sets in motion a seasonal change for your marriage. Circumstances are neutral or at least they are common. Therefore, it is not what happens to us. But how we interpret what happens to us, our attitude that makes the difference between success and failure. Let me show you the difference in the lives of two couples. Betsy and Crick and Charles and Kelly. Betsy and Crick had been married 12 years when they experienced the death of their 9-year-old son. He was killed instantly by an automobile as he rode his bicycle from the driveway into the street. In my first conversation with Betsy, which occurred less than 6 hours after the accident, I discovered the seeds of blame. She said I had just told Craig last week that he needs to spend more time with Andrew, talking with him about safety rules for riding his bicycle. If Craig had talked with him, maybe this would have not happened. Later in talking with Craig, I sense a similar attitude. I have never liked this place, he said. I told Betsy two years ago that I wanted us to get a little farm. I don't like raising kids in the city. It's too dangerous. I wish I had listened to my heart. Two months later, in other conversation, I found Crick rehearsing the same message again. I just wish we would have moved to the farm two years ago. Betsy resisted the idea. She said it was so much more convenient in the city, but there is more to life than convenience. The following week, I met with Betsy and found that she too had been playing the same message in her mind for two months. If only Crick had talked to Andrew about safety rules, maybe Andrew would still be with us. Betsy was blaming Crick and Crick was blaming Betsy. They would not have said it directly to one another, but the attitudes reveal the truth. I wish I could say that through counseling, Crick and Betsy changed their attitudes and found comfort and hope. The reality is that in less than a year, they were separated and shortly thereafter divorced, creating additional pain for their other two sons, ages 5 and 7. Negative attitudes led to negative behavior, which ended in bitterness and divorce. Charles and Kelly experienced a very similar tra tragedy but with very different results. Andrea, their seven-year-old daughter, drowned in the backyard pool while both parents were in the house. Charles and Kelly were planning to join Andrea for a swim, but she jumped in before they arrived. She was a good swimmer. Kelly said, and she had never gone into the pool without our being there. That was one of our rules. I don't know what happened. I had several sessions with Kelly and Charles over the next six months. Never once did I hear them blame each other, and never once did they blame Andrea. She was just being a child, Kelly said, with tears coursing down her cheeks. No need to blame her for breaking our body rule. It won't bring her back. Deeply pained, Charles and Kelly talked their way through their grief, gave each other the freedom to cry, held each other tenderly, and survived the deal with an even stronger marriage. We had a good marriage, Charles said, but the loss of Andrea has brought us even closer together. We know we can't bring her back, but we can go to be with her. We want to be good parents to our son and trust God with the future. In the year since Andrea's death, Charles and Kelly have gone on to live fruitful, productive lives. God gave them two additional children 
whom they are rearing in a very nurturing home. The difference between the two couples was basically a difference in attitude. Both were deeply hurt. Both suffered tragic loss. One couple chose an attitude of blame, whereas the other couple chose an attitude of acceptance and support. Attitude made all the difference. God gave us Andrea and we had her for seven wonderful years. Charles said she brought us great joy and now she is in the presence of God. She loved Jesus. We loved her and we know we will see her again someday. We know that she will not want us to sit around grieving her death for the next 20 years. As long as God gives us life, we want to be faithful in loving and caring for our other children and serving God. As Charles tried to summarize their attitude, Kelly was nodding her head affirmingly. Together, they were demonstrating the power of a positive attitude in the midst of tragedy. A Christian worldwide view that is a biblical perspective on life makes it much easier for couples to have a positive mental attitude. Perhaps you are asking, what is this Christian worldview that fosters such as positive attitude? Let me mention some of the characteristics. Characteristics of a Christian worldview. Every human being is made in the image of God and is therefore extremely valuable. Each person is uniquely gifted by God including the mentality and physically challenged. Each person has a unique role to play in life. Marriage is God's idea. Husbands and wives are intended to complement each other. The object of marriage is to glorify God by serving one's spouse and helping the spouse reach his or her God-given potential. First is a recognition that every human being is made in the image of God and is therefore extremely valuable. Second, each person is uniquely gifted by God, including the mentally and physically challenged. Third, each person has a unique role to play in life. Fourth, marriage is God's idea. Thus, a man and a woman are uniquely created to work together as a team. Each has strengths and weakness. Each is called upon to complement the other. If they learn how to do this, they will accomplish more than they would never have accomplished as individuals. Fifth, the goal of marriage is that husbands and wives voluntarily serve each other. Helping each other reach their potential for God and promoting good in the world. When I meditate on these five truths, I am down to a positive attitude towards Krylin, my wife. My attitude is not based on her behavior, but on my beliefs about who she is and about my role in her life. Looking back on the various winter seasons of my marriage, I realized that my attitude during those times was not one of the positive regard for Krylin. Instead, I focused on what I considered to be her weaknesses, hurt or irritated by the things she said or left unsaid. Annoyed by the things she did or failed to do, I found myself thinking the worst kind of thoughts about her and mentally blaming her for a poor relationship. In my counseling practice, I have since developed discovered how common that destructive pattern of thinking is. One example is Marilyn from Kansas City who had been married to Bruce for 29 years. She indicated that she was definitely in a winter marriage. I feel unloved and angry, she said. How did you arrive at this season of marriage? I asked. We arrived here because of my husband's work. His job during parts of the year is demanding and requires lots of hours. So he is away from home most of the day. During these times, I became the head of the household, taking care of the boys and the finances. Also, he becomes distant and we don't have much communication. This has happened a lot during our 29 years of marriage 
and I would like to stop the cycle. The good news is that Marilyn can stop the cycle. It begins by changing her attitude toward her husband. He is obviously a hard-working man, bringing home the bacon. And by Marilyn's own testimony, he has never been sexually unfaithful to her. These are admirable traits. But Bruce has obviously not met Marilyn's emotional need for love and companionship. That is why she considers her marriage to be in the winter season. Without realizing it, Marilyn has been sabotaging her marriage with a negative attitude. She had allowed the emotions of hurt, anger and feelings of neglect to control her behavior toward Bruce. She has been verbally critical of him and the time he spends on the job, often saying such things as, You let the company take advantage of you. You don't make any extra money for all the hours you invest. You ought to demand that they pay you more. On other occasions, she has forced on his neglect of the children. How do you expect to have a positive influence on our boys when you don't spend any time with them? The fact that Boones played ball with the boys every Sunday afternoon and sometimes took them on business trips with him was overlooked in Marilyn's verbal tirades. Bruce's attitude was also affected. I don't ever do anything right, he said. No matter what I do, it's never enough. So I have quit trying to please her. I tune her out when she gets in her long speeches. I just wish the boys didn't have to live in such a negative household. Bruce is also focusing on Marilyn's weakness and ignoring her strengths. The hours she spends tending to the household and helping the boys with homework are in back of his mind, but what occupies his attention and guides his thinking and are his focus on her angry lectures. All this could change in Bruce and Marilyn would choose a winning attitude. At the moment, they are continuing to perpetuate the winter season of marriage by their negative thinking towards each other. Breaking the cycle of negativity. What is involved in choosing a winning attitude? First, we must acknowledge our negative thinking. Most of us tend to rationalize and excuse our negative attitudes. We say, how do you expect me to react when they treat me like that? Or as one woman said, while pointing her finger at her husband in my counseling office, yes, I have a negative attitude and there's a reason for it. He's sitting right here. As long as we rationalize our negative attitudes as legitimate, they will never change. If, however, we are tired of winter and would like to feel the hope of springtime again, we must recognize that our negative thinking must change. Our thinking guides our behavior. If we think negatively, we will behave in destructive ways. But if we think positively, our actions will be positive as well. The second step toward a winning attitude is identifying your spouse's positive characteristics. I suggest that you make a written list. Ask God to bring to your mind all the positive things about your spouse and then write them down. Enlist the help of your child by saying something like this. I am working on changing my attitude toward your father or mother. And I am trying to identify some of his positive traits. Would you tell me the things you like about your father, the things you appreciate and admire? I want to make a list. Not only with you, get good feedback from your children, but you will also influence the thinking to turn in a positive direction. If your spouse has physically and or verbally abused the children, you might preface your request by saying something like this. I know that you feel hurt by your father in many ways, so do I, but I am trying to change my attitude and give him credit for the positive contributions he makes to our lives. I need your help. With help from God and your kids, you will probably be able to make a fairly long list of your spouse's positive traits. 
However, even if the list is short, at least you have something positive on which to focus. One lady said about her husband, I have to say he is a good whistler. It irritates me at times, but I have never heard anyone whistle better than he does. I guess he must have grown up with the song, Whistle While You Work, because that is what he does all the time. Thank you so much. We will end it up today. Let's continue it tomorrow. Please do subscribe to my channel.